Vice-Chancellor, and may I say, distinguished guests all. Uh, I thank the university uh, for the invitation to deliver this year's Gandhi oration, and I'd like to offer some reflections on contemporary Australian life in the light of Gandhi's legacy. I wonder what Gandhi would have made of Australia in 2017, a place that many people who live here regard as, without question, the best country in the world. And there are things to be proud of in Australia. We have a robust parliamentary democracy. Uh, we're replacing our prime ministers at an unsustainable rate. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in fact, I'm told that paramedics can no longer use the question, who is the Prime Minister? <laughs> it's no longer a reliable test of cognitive function in the bewildered or the concussed. Uh, well, we have our spectacular beaches, we have our famous harbour, we have our bush, our mountains, we have some of the world's cutest wildlife, some of the world's most livable cities. Uh, we have among the world's most highly educated populations with unprecedented numbers of students enrolled at universities, uh, many of which, like this one, are world class. We have relatively low employment. Uh, a relatively high, though falling, rate of home ownership. Uh, we're still going through a record period of sustained economic growth. We have a sound financial system, uh, though it is accompanied by high and perhaps disturbing levels of government and personal debt. This is a place where we pride ourselves on the fair go a place where we enjoy freedom of speech, freedom of religion, a little question mark there. Uh, perhaps as a, as a footnote I might mention uh, that the fastest growing religion in Australia is Hinduism. And no, Pauline, we are not being overrun by Muslims. Uh, Muslims in fact account for 2.2% of the Australian population. But freedom of religion is certainly something we say we believe in. Freedom of assembly, freedom of the press. No wonder everyone wants to come here, tourists, immigrants, and yes, even refugees. This is a place where you might think the dream of egalitarianism could finally come true. It certainly is a place where we've managed to create a, a harmonious society out of extraordinary cultural and ethnic diversity, bringing together people from almost 200 different birthplaces around the world. Yes, it's a remarkable place. And yet, all is clearly not well. We are in a society in the grip of epidemics of anxiety, obesity, Depression, 20% of Australians will experience some form of mental illness. More than one million Australian children are living in poverty. Although we pride ourselves on our low rate of unemployment, we often prefer to overlook uh, the massive problem of underemployment. Two million Australians are either unemployed or underemployed, 100,000 Australians are homeless. We live with unacceptable rates of violence. A few years ago, The Economist published the results of a global survey of reported rates of serious assault, and guess which country in the world was top of the list? with the highest reported rate of serious assault, Australia. We're further from egalitarianism, I suggest, than we were 50 years ago. We're showing signs of a disturbing retreat from the values of an open and progressive society for which we were once famous. How did this happen? 
How did a society like ours in a place like this become so edgy, so anxious, so violent? Where did this rather uneasy Australian blend of arrogance and timidity come from? Could it perhaps be the result of growing income inequality in Australia, another thing we don't like to talk about much, uh, that's produced an unprecedentedly large gap between rich and poor Australians and more wealthy and more poor Australians than ever before? Well, inequality certainly breeds insecurity and poverty certainly has bad consequences for health but anxiety and depression are not confined to any particular social or economic stratum. Uh, could all this anxiety be perhaps the result of our declining respect for institutions uh, of all kinds, the church, politics, the banks, the trade unions, the media, even universities? that's led to widespread disenchantment and disillusionment in Australia. And of course, it's a Western disease, not just an Australian one. But we create our institutions to serve us. Interesting that the Vice-Chancellor used exactly that term, serving, uh, in talking about the role of UNSW in this society and indeed around the world. We create all our institutions to formalise certain functions of our society. They exist to serve us. And so when we suspect that they're being corrupted by their own power or becoming inward or self-protective in their focus, we're understandably disappointed and perhaps even outraged. You may have seen recent media reports uh, of some global research conducted by the Edelman uh, organization showing that trust in big business around the world, but especially in Australia, is in sharp decline. And we all know what's happened to esteem for the institutional church and for politics. Another international survey published just in the last week or so conducted by Ipsos showed that 70% of Australians believe the nation, uh, and I quote from the survey, needs a strong leader to take the country back from the rich and powerful. 70% of Australians believe that. 68% believe the economy is rigged to the advantage of the rich and powerful. 61% believe traditional parties and politicians don't care about people like me. Now that decline in respect for contemporary institutions of all kinds might well contribute to our level of anxiety, though in fact I suspect the main response among people who lose faith in an institution is disgust rather than anxiety. I think people generally are more likely to switch off or retreat into cynicism rather than to worry about it. Well, I believe Mahatma Gandhi might have had something very significant to say about everything I've been describing. I suspect that Gandhi would have wanted to remind us that if we lose our capacity for unconditional compassion, if we lose sight of our true nature as members of a society, if we focus too much on our own wants, our own entitlements, our own gratifications, with little regard for the needs and the well-being of others, there will be an inevitable threat to our mental health. Over the years, particularly over the last 20 years, my own research has consistently identified loss of community as one of the most common concerns among contemporary Australians. That concern is often expressed as a regret that local neighbourhoods are not functioning as well as they once did. We don't know our neighbours has become almost a cliche of contemporary urban life. Now, we don't know our neighbours is never said with pride or pleasure. It's not as though people are saying, at last, we've achieved this situation we've been striving for where we have neighbours we don't know. What a relief. No one ever says that. They say it wistfully. They say it with a touch of sadness 
we don't know our neighbours, feeling like a stranger in your own street, and I'm quoting verbatim from one of my research projects, uh, is bound to fuel a sense of insecurity. A disturbing piece of research was published a few years ago by Edith Cowan University in Perth, national survey showing that only 35% of Australians say they trust their neighbours. Now that could not possibly mean that 65% of Australians have untrustworthy neighbours, could it? Uh, what it must mean is that 65% of Australians don't know their neighbours well enough to have learned to trust them because generally speaking, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, when we get to know people, we find at the very least we can rub along with them uh, and probably even trust them. Now, I'm not, of course, suggesting that the erosion of our commitment to the community we live in is the sole cause of our epidemic of anxiety or even the primary cause in many cases. Anxiety and depression are complex mental states and the result of a complex blend of biological and social factors. But what I am suggesting is that when we lose sight of our role as neighbours, the health of the neighbourhood suffers, and when the health of the neighbourhood suffers, we all suffer. When we ignore our biological destiny as social creatures, people who need each other, people for whom a sense of belonging is fundamental to our well-being, people who utterly rely on communities to sustain us and nurture us, uh, protect us and define us, then our level of anxiety is likely to rise. So is there less community? Is this all a myth? Uh, is this just something people say? Or is there less community engagement than previously? Are local neighbourhoods less stable and less cohesive than they once were. Well, when you look at the evidence, it's hard to argue with the popular perception. And let me quickly remind you, it won't be news to you, but let me just remind you of some of the factors that have been propelling us in the direction of becoming a more fragmented, more individualistic, more competitive, less cooperative and therefore more anxious society. First, the most obvious one, the rate and the relentlessness of social, cultural, economic, uh, technological change. Now that's not exactly a new process. In fact, it's a process that started with the Industrial Revolution. But humans are slow to adapt. And even after 200 or 250 years, many of the signs of our slow adaptation to the impact of the Industrial Revolution can be seen in an underlying sense of uncertainty, unpredictability and insecurity. That revolution changed the way uh, people live and work. And while we have been over all this time trying to adapt to the effects of the Industrial Revolution, we have of course had many more recent revolutions to cope with at the same time. The gender revolution, arguably the greatest revolution of the 20th century. Uh, an economic restructure amounting to revolution, an information technology revolution, even a revolution in our sense of who we are, our, our sense of cultural identity as Australians. Now, the symptoms of those revolutions and the fallout, the outcome of those revolutions are very familiar to all of us. Let me just quickly run through what I think are the seven or eight of the most obvious ones. Our changing patterns of marriage and divorce, one of the most uh, obvious of the consequences of the gender revolution. We're now a society in which somewhere between 35 and 40% of marriages will end in divorce with consequential disruption, pain for the couples who are divorcing, pain for their families, a pain for their friendship circles and communities, and of course pain for the kids if there are kids are involved, uh, which is why we now have in Australia a million dependent kids who live with just one of their natural parents. 
We have half a million kids involved in a regular mass migration once a week or once a fortnight from the home of the custodial parent to the home of the non-custodial parent. Obviously disruptive, not just for the kids, uh, but for the families and for the micro communities that those kids are moving in and out of. And while we're talking about kids, let's acknowledge another huge uh, social change, our plummeting birth rate. Uh, it did go up fleetingly under the influence of the baby bonus, just as Peter Costello said it would, uh, but that was just a little blip on a downward graph. Uh, the birth rate is now um, 1.7 babies per woman, way below replacement level of 2.1. Uh, what that means is that children, that great social lubricant, uh, kids often the ones who begin the process of forming social networks in local neighbourhoods and communities, that social lubricant is in shorter supply than ever. Uh, and we have to compensate for that. Notice that we are compensating. If you want to amuse yourself, take a look at two graphs. One is the falling birth rate, the other is the rising rate of pet ownership in Australia. Uh, and if you doubt whether dogs are being acquired as child substitutes, just notice how many are given human names these days. In fact, I recently met a dog called Ian. Uh, 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 I think that's a wonderful name for a vice chancellor, uh, but somehow it seemed like an odd name for a dog. Well, uh, that's the way we're going. Uh, the rise of the two-income household, another massive social change. Uh, I'm not commenting on uh, the value of this and not suggesting we ought to be turning the clock back, but we ought to notice the consequences. The two-income household means that we are, as a society, busier than ever before. That in all of those households, there is less time and energy available for nurturing the community than there used to be. People will typically say, I don't have time for that kind of thing. It's one reason why I don't know my neighbours. We're just so busy. Our rapidly shrinking households, arguably the greatest single social change in Australia over the last 100 years. Again, gradual. In the last 100 years, uh, while our population has been increasing fivefold, the number of households has been increasing tenfold. So we're getting smaller and smaller. Uh, we're down to an average Australian household now of 2.5 people. And the biggest single category of household in Australia, accounting now for almost 30% of all Australian households, is the single person household. That's also the fastest growing household type in Australia, as it is, by the way, in America and the parts of Canada and other countries we compare ourselves with. Now, the fact that there are so many single-person households and if you put single-person and two-person households together, you've got about 53% of all Australian households, um, you just have to, again, notice what the likely social consequences of this will be. The risk of increased loneliness, not the, not the certainty of it, but the heightened risk of loneliness of people, particularly in those single-person households, experiencing social isolation and even alienation. Again, we have to compensate. Notice one of the main ways we're compensating, again, two graphs, uh, the, uh, the uh, shrinking household, uh, the rapid rise in eating out opportunities, the explosion of coffee shops and cafes and so on uh, all over Australia as people who live alone want to connect with the human herd by grazing with the human herd. <laughs> Uh, we've even invented those appalling things called food courts, uh, which are a sort of public trough where people go uh, and, and, and graze with the herd, uh, uh, feeling connected even if they don't feel like mooing at the time. <coughs> uh, our increasing mobility is a huge uh, uh, destabilising uh, uh, factor. Uh, in its effect on local neighbourhoods and communities. Australians, on average, are moving house once every six years, exactly the same as Americans. Uh, we're, we're mobile, of course, in another sense. Uh, almost universal car ownership uh, means that we spend a lot of our time isolated in those little capsules, and increasing use of the motor car is, uh, equals declining use of footpaths, therefore fewer opportunities to stop and chat with neighbours, even if we had time. 
our love affair with high-rise, high-density housing development is another factor, leading in most high-rise apartment blocks to an obsession with privacy and security. In fact, some of the highest high-rise blocks really should have residential uh, therapeutic help on hand uh, to help people who are living in such unnatural circumstances which makes them less neighbourly than they might otherwise be. And of course the information technology revolution that has not just blurred the traditional distinction between data transfer and communication, hasn't just altered our perceptions of privacy and even identity, especially those heavy users of the internet uh, with somewhere between five and ten different identities according to which medium they're on or which application. Uh, but of course it's also uh, made it easier than ever for us to stay apart. We're said to be more connected than ever and in one sense we are, but that has meant ironically, paradoxically, we're also more disconnected than ever in the face-to-face -face sense. Well, the likely, I won't go on with all that, but the likely cumulative effect of all those uh, social, economic, technical changes is very easy to imagine. Taken together, they exert great pressure on the stability and cohesiveness of communities. Now that pressure is not irresistible, and in a few moments I want to talk about how we might resist it. But unless we resist it, that pressure will steadily increase the risk of fragmentation and social isolation. It's already clear that many of us are stressed by the struggle to keep up with the rate of change in our lives. One of the consequences of that stress is anxiety, and another consequence of it is violence, both physical and emotional, often in response to a seemingly small irritation that turned out to have been the last straw for someone who was having trouble coping. Now a second source, so that's one category, a second source of pressure uh, towards individualism and therefore uh, fragmentation and therefore I would argue heightened anxiety, uh, the second source of pressure is exerted by the powerful propaganda that's been coming to our society, relentlessly coming to our society, from two very different sources, two very different directions, but adding up to the same essential message, which is, it's all about me, and that I must look after number one. One source of that propaganda is the increasingly sophisticated, increasingly pervasive a consumer mass marketing that promotes materialism and greed. More things will save you, more stuff will save you, and by the way, that materialist message is reinforced every day by political and other leaders who insist on reducing everything to economics. But the deeper message in all of that propaganda uh, is not so much about materialism as it is about individualism. This is about my comfort my prosperity, my stuff, my well-being. Now essentially the same message, though in a very different guise and from a very different direction, has been coming at us from what I now think of as the happiness industry, promoting the idea that we're all entitled to happiness, indeed that happiness is our default position. Uh, if you're not happy, there's something wrong with you, get happy come to one of our conferences, buy one of our books, pop one of our pills, uh, or take some other substance, licit or illicit, to get you into the state that you're entitled to be in. Now, don't get me wrong, I am not against happiness. Uh, I love being happy. Uh, I was recently described by someone as an anti-happiness crusader. Uh, <laughs> this is completely false, but I do acknowledge the truth of ancient wisdom on this topic, which is that if you pursue happiness, it will elude you. If you think you're entitled to be happy, you've missed the whole point of happiness. If you privilege happiness above all the emotions, then you fail to grasp one of the loveliest truths about the human condition, that each of us has a full spectrum of emotions to draw on, to help us cope 
with whatever life throws at us. The highs, the lows, the disappointments, the tragedies, the triumphs, the sadness, the gratifications, the pain, the loss, the tedium. And every point on the emotional spectrum is as valid and as authentic as every other point on the spectrum because every point on the spectrum has something important to teach us about what it means to be human. And no point on the spectrum would make any sense without the context of all the others. If I could bestow, if tonight if I could bestow perpetual happiness on you, you would never be happy. Uh, because it's something you can only experience by contrast with sadness. So the pursuit of happiness, not happiness, but the pursuit of happiness is a health hazard. Teaching our children that they are entitled to be happy, or even worse, that we expect them to be happy. Come on, give us a smile, we say, when a child is unhappy. Uh, simply sets them up for completely unrealistic expectations of what life is like, and builds in the probability of disappointment and even anger when they discover that life isn't turning out the way their parents promised it would. Well, the effect of all that propaganda from those two very different directions can be seen in the burgeoning me culture, which has Western society like ours in its grip. Think of the epidemic of selfies. Uh, think of the widespread use of social media not to communicate but to brag. Think of the growing emphasis on personal entitlement rather than civic responsibility. The message of the me culture is of course antithetical to our true nature as communitarians. Our, our identity, as I've already mentioned, depends utterly on the groups that we belong to. It's not something that you can dream up in isolation. We are people who will shrivel up emotionally, if not physically, if we're not nurtured by the experience of engaging with the lives and even sharing the pain of those around us. And a third a contributor to our present level of anxiety is the growing rumble of those three enormous threats. Threats on such a large scale, they seem utterly beyond our control. The threat of climate change, the threat of international terrorism, the threat of a major global economic disruption. In the face of threats like these, many of us feel so powerless, so vulnerable, that we deal with our anxiety or our fear by simply retreating into a shell of self-absorption. I can't control any of that, so I'll focus on what I can control. The bathroom renovations, uh, the school I'll send my kids to, or the quest for a perfect latte, or some other uh, um, uh, self-absorbed pursuit. Well, what I'm suggesting is that under the influence of all these factors, we're losing our sense of human connectedness and therefore our sense of human compassion. We're not living as if we need each other, though we do. We're not living as if our own health depends on the communities we belong to, though it does. We're not living as if we understand that a good life can only be a life lived for others, though that's all it can ever be. How else can you make sense of the idea of a morally good life? You can't be good on your own. Morality is only ever about how we treat other people. Goodness is inherently about responding to other people's need of our kindness, charity, compassion, respect, our love. Love, it's one of those words, isn't it? We use it, of course, to refer to romantic passion, to refer to close friendship. Uh, we use it rather glibly uh, to refer to our affection for music or food or travel or pets or poetry. Uh, we love all those things. And all those kinds of love are about our emotional responses to each other or to those things I've described. But the kind of love that transforms neighborhoods, communities, entire societies, actually has nothing whatever to do 
with our emotional responses to each other. This kind of love has nothing to do with affection. Transforming love is motivational, not emotional. It's a tough mental discipline that involves our commitment to kindness and compassion as a way of life. It's the discipline of approaching every situation with a charitable disposition, with an inherent sense of respect for the other person, and with a determination to be kind no matter what our differences may be. That's the way we defuse violence. It's the way we turn conflict into cooperation. One of Gandhi's wisest contributions to this way of thinking was to urge us to acknowledge that when we find ourselves in conflict with someone's ideas, it's the conflict itself that is our opponent, not each other. Gandhi's so-called passive resistance, a term which he himself rejected, was really about replacing the force of violence with the combined force of truth and compassion, what Gandhi called soul force. Now, there's a very Christian idea, but not exclusively Christian. It's also a very Hindu idea at the heart of this discipline. It's the idea that we should expand our interpretation of that, say, of that saying, love your neighbor, not only by redefining what we mean by love in the way I've suggested, but also by redefining what we mean by neighbor to include everyone. Not just those who are like us and those who agree with us, but those who are decidedly not like us and those we disagree with as well. It's easy to be kind and compassionate towards those we like, not so easy towards those we don't like. And yet how we, ex how we respond to those we don't like is the ultimate test of whether we've acquired the discipline most fundamental to mental health the, dis the discipline of a loving disposition. One consequence of our embrace of the loving disposition is that we would abandon the primitive notion of revenge. In the same way as a truly civilized person renounces violence as a way of achieving our ends, so a truly civilized person renounces the idea that if I've been treated badly, then I'm entitled to act badly in response. Revenge is a way of bringing us both down to the same level of bad behavior, wrestling in the moral mud. The only possible response of the civilized person who's been wronged or offended is to forgive and where practicable to help repair the damage. That's how we build a better society, by responding to bad behavior with good behavior, by responding to ugliness with beauty, by responding to treachery with integrity, by responding to lies with truth. So to conclude, let me quickly revisit what I was saying about the state of the nation, our growing disenchantment with institutions, our tendency to disengage from serious social issues that confront us, like homelessness, the plight of asylum seekers, the enduring problem of Aboriginal health, uh, the problem of growing inequality of income, the increasing fragmentation of families, neighborhoods and communities, and perhaps as a consequence of that, the rising epidemic of anxiety. That is, from one point of view, the state of the nation. Well, it's easy to complain about the state of the nation, isn't it? To wring our hands uh, and to wish that a leader could make everything right. Remember that Ipsos research, 70% uh, of us saying we want a strong leader uh, to fix things. Uh, there's a very long history of human societies placing far too much faith in their leaders to save them from whatever they think they need saving from. And of course it's true that the best leaders can both inspire and reassure us by placing us in a narrative we can understand and offering policy solutions to our social and, yes, our economic problems. 
But as part of the general decline in trust in contemporary Australian politics, our esteem for the current crop of leaders has plummeted. And more broadly, both Trump and Brexit can be partially interpreted as reactions to similar disenchantment in the US and the UK. And in one way, this, at least in our context, this might be no bad thing. It might encourage us, if we have no particular faith in the current crop of leaders, it might encourage us to look differently at the situation and take matters into our own hands by embracing the idea, which is the title of my address, that the state of the nation actually starts in the street where you live. We can't individually manage the economy, of course, but we can decide to spend and save wisely. We can decide to be more generous to the needy, the marginalised, the disadvantaged, the brutalised. We, can, we can't stop the rising tide of technology, but we can be its masters, not its servants. And when it comes to the character and the values of our society, then it really is up to us. We can have a powerful influence on the state of the various communities we belong to in the neighbourhood, the workplace, the university, the church or other faith community, the sporting association, the book club or other community, community organisations, how we contribute to those miniatures of life in our own family, our own street, our own suburb, will help to determine the big picture. Of course, we all know how to act like neighbours when there's a crisis, floods, bushfires, storms, or horrific events like the carnage in Melbourne's Burke Street uh, less than two weeks ago. Of course, bystanders rushed to the aid of the injured. Of course, people instinctively help those in pain and distress. That's the kind of species we belong to. It's only newsworthy if we don't respond to people in pain and distress. So why does it so often take a crisis to remind us of what a neighbour is and what a neighbour does? Why does it so often take a crisis to remind us of our responsibility to the other members of the community, perhaps especially the elderly and the isolated in our community whose need of help, perhaps in the form of nothing more than a bit of conversation, might not be as obvious as an accident victim's? You think people aren't as friendly as they once were? You think there's an avoidance of eye contact when you're walking along a street in a city like Sydney? Well, be more friendly. Start making eye contact. Do better than that. Start smiling and actually saying hello to people at the bus stop, in a lift, in the checkout queue, and especially in the street or the apartment where you live. You don't know your neighbours? Here's a really creative idea. Knock on their door and introduce yourself. Become the kind of person who is always alert to the possibility that someone needs your help or attention. Join a local book club or a community choir. Participate in a community garden. Play a team game with a local club. Become a regular at your local cafe. In other words, engage. Be there. And, by the way, don't worry about how you're feeling about any of this. Don't worry about whether being kind to people is making you happy. That's not why you're doing it. <laughs> if you're looking for something to worry about, worry about whether you gave someone your undivided attention when they needed it. Worry about whether you really listened or just pretended to. Worry about whether you apologised quickly enough if you wronged or offended someone. Worry about whether you forgave quickly and sincerely enough if someone wronged or offended you. Worry about whether you were there when someone, perhaps a total stranger, needed your encouragement and support. If enough of us start living as if this is the kind of society we want it to be, that is the kind of society it will become. As Gandhi put it, in one of my favourite Gandhi quotes, though not a particularly well-known one, you may never know what results come of your actions, but if you do nothing, there will be no results. Thank you.